some time ago who were wrapping that song up. The song leader was really a, a great song leader. And when he got through, the congregation sat down. He was really thrilled and he turned around and looked at the preachers who were stepping up. He said, don't mess it up. <laughs> so I whispered to Craig. I said, good job. I said, I hope I do all right following behind you here. What a great day we had yesterday. I hope it's a great one today for us, all of us. Got your buckets ready to be filled with the, what the Word of God says. It, uh, it, it humbles me. Uh, I'm supposed to step up here and talk about God and His Word and speak on behalf of God. I need to be sitting down there and waiting for somebody really good to get up here. But we're in this together. So I'll share and we'll share and just get your buckets open. We'll read from God's Word. We're talking again about basics. We talked about basics part one and part two the last few weeks. Uh, first one on becoming a Christian. The second one dealing with the church, the birth of the church and just exactly what it's about, the importance particularly about that. And today we're talking about the basics, marks of a disciple. And it may take it in a direction you might not think about particularly, but uh, definitely be biblical. I want to start in Matthew chapter 5, so if you want to open your Bibles uh, back to that page, we were reading there just a few moments ago. And, and as you're turning there, I want you to think about, as Jesus walked along the earth, and he was just getting started, he was looking over who he might pick as apostles, and beginning to preach and teach. Matthew chapter 4 deals with some of the things that he did, the multitudes that followed him. Then chapter 5, we're commonly aware that those have read this, uh, that it's sometimes described as the beginning of the, the Sermon on the Mount. And if you have a red letter edition like I do here, a whole lot of that, two, three pages, is, is all in red because it's what Jesus is saying. Not to separate, by the way, uh, the red from the black. All of it is God's Word. And any time God speaks, we ought to listen. But here's Jesus, and He's starting His ministry, and it's obvious by those around that He's there to make an impact. That He's there to influence people on God's behalf. He, he is speaking for God. And as he's doing so, there's a lot of things that are going on the Pharisees don't like. Uh, these are the people that are dressed up in special garments to look spiritual. And Jesus, by all behavior, is demonstrating leadership. But he's not following in the footsteps or the system of the Pharisees. He's dressed just like everybody else. And he associates with all these people, and he's, he's not fitting into their system of what a religious leader should look like and act like. And he doesn't go asking them for, for permission about things, or, or looking up to them, or referring back to what some of these Pharisees say. And it's obvious that he's going to do things his own way, and they don't like that. And they don't like the crowds that he's drawing after him, because he's making an impact. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, as people are listening and watching Jesus and wondering what He's up to, He says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. Now, he's a follower of all the Old Testament. But I did come not to destroy, but to fulfill God's Word. But as you're looking along with what he says here, it's obvious that he's changing things. And we read just a small segment of it a while ago here from verses 33 and following where he says, You've heard that it was said of those people of old, and then he goes along and he quotes them, You should not swear by whatever. But he says, But I say unto you, now that little phrase, You've heard it said, but I say unto you this, is repeated over and over 
through Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, verse 27, verse 32, verse 33, verse 38, and over and over again. So when you get through listening to what Jesus is saying here, I am an individual, Jesus says. I'm not following after the rest of the system. But I have some authority, and I'm going to tell you really about God's Word and how your lives ought to behave. And so they're sitting there listening. And chapter 5 goes by, and chapter 6 goes by, and chapter 7, as best I can tell, and it's just a, a guess, that this is probably excerpts of lengthy sermons that Jesus did over a period of I don't know how many days. But when it gets to the very end, in verse 28 of chapter 7, of what we conclude of reading the Sermon on the Mount, it says that when Jesus finished... He had ended these sayings and the people were astonished at his teaching. Not necessarily his ability, I'm sure that was part of it. For he taught them, verse 29 says, as one having authority and not as the scribes. The scribes were used to quoting another scribe of old. And if you could quote somebody who was legitimate or powerful or influential, then that was to make a point. He didn't even refer to any of the scribes. Matter of fact, he said, you heard it said this, but I'm going to tell you this. All authority is on me, Jesus is saying. And so as he's doing this, and the people are wondering, what is he looking for in people? The question to my mind is, what is he wanting out of a disciple? What is he asking? Where does he look? And the answer to me comes very clear throughout what Jesus does. But I'm going to go back to an Old Testament passage to start with. So turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And we're going to look at where God looks for the marks of a disciple. Now we're going to do a quick analysis between two Old Testament characters. One named Saul, who is the first king of Israel, and the second one who came after him named David. Now I'm just going to tell you a little bit because we don't have time to go through all the details about Saul, but Saul was a good leader to start with, head and shoulders and height above everybody else, and, and, and powerful individual, and, and did as an army leader, which he was called to do, to, to vanquish and destroy Philistines, and, and he did a great job in that for a while, but he lost his humility in the process. And there's some things that go on there that are not good in Saul's background. In chapter 13 of 1 Samuel, he, he stepped way, way out of bounds as he's waiting for Samuel, this is a prophet of God and a priest, to, to come and offer a sacrifice. And this was a typical thing. Before the king goes into battle, we need a sacrifice. We want God on our side. And so we're going to offer a special sacrifice. Well, Samuel wasn't there. Saul was ready, and, and he could hear the armies out there in front of him wrestling their armor, and he was getting nervous. And he waited, and he waited, and waited, and finally he decided, I'll just do it myself. Notice something here, by the way. As you look to the Old Testament law, there's nothing mentioned about a king can't offer a sacrifice. All that is mentioned was it was a job of the priest. Period. Didn't go listing all the other people that couldn't. They just weren't authorized because only the priest was supposed to go. Well, here's God's king, anointed one of God, and he's, he, he's nervous and he's anxious and his men are worried and the soldiers uh, on the opposing side are, are really stressed and they're getting ready to go after him and finally, I'll just do it myself and he offers a sacrifice. And no sooner had he stopped, the sacrifice had ended, Samuel showed up. And you're reading that chapter and you find that God rejects Sam, or rather, uh, Saul right there because of that one act. Now later on he'll do something else that's just as foolish for not obeying what God says completely. David, on the other hand, in chapter 16, is introduced to us. And, and, and as you look at what's going on there, it, it's such a contrast. So Samuel is sent by God now to go out and anoint a new king. Now this is not 
typical for that day and time. Because as Saul was king, what's supposed to be done is the next guy in line in his lineage should be the next king. But no, that's not what God chooses. So he sends out Samuel the prophet now to go out and anoint a new king. And so as he does so, Samuel's, I guess, happy about doing this, a little concerned because uh, Saul's still king. And he doesn't want Saul to find out about all of this because he could get in trouble. Uh, so he has a little discussion with God about all those things, and God says, I'm sending you to go, we'll take care of you. So he sends him down to the house of Jesse. And as Samuel is going there, in chapter 16, verse 5, we pick up what's going on here. He's asking if he's come for peace, and he says, yes, I've come peaceably. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come to me in sacrifice, uh, that we may consecrate Jesse and his sons, and I've invited them to sacrifice. And so it was that when they came, that Samuel looked at Eliab. That's one of Jesse's sons. And he thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Ah, he's another big, powerful, muscular, tough guy. And we need this. In verse 7, it's like God taps him on the shoulder. He sit down. We're not anointing this one. Uh, I'm paraphrasing that part, but verse 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I refused him. For the Lord does not look as man sees, or see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at his what? The marks of a discipleship, even going back to the Old Testament, starts with the heart. Everything that we're going to talk about deals with the heart. This is what God is looking for. He's wanting to see what's inside, not on the outside. The outside might be ugly. The outside might be crippled. The outside might not be educated. God wants to know about your heart and where it is. And so we'll talk about two particular things that I see here in the life of David. Number one, he had a heart that was devoted to God, dedicated to God. And number two, he had a heart that trusted in his God above all else. Devoted and trusting. Now let's look at 1 Samuel 17 case that you're probably very well aware of, David before Goliath. And, and as this situation is coming about, now try to remember that Goliath is a little bit bigger than David, right? What is it? How many feet? Nine feet tall, we're estimating? They, they talk in cubits. And, and, and David's just a little lad as described by the scriptures. He's not even big enough to be in the army yet. But as he's coming along and he's hearing what's going on, he is bothered immensely by this guy who is a Philistine that's stepping out in front of the Philistine army and challenging Israel to put a man up to match up with him. Let's just do it right here. The two of us go at it. Just send out your best man. And as far as God's army is concerned, all they have on the other side was a bunch of chickens. We called them when we were kids. Nobody would step up. Maybe they were fearful because they knew they'd lose. And that's not any good either. So in this whole process of time, David is sent to go out and check on his older brothers who are in the army. His dad sent them out to see how things are going and carry some extra food out there and, and see how things are happening. And so David shows up on the scene. Verse 29. Let's start at verse 28 here because he runs into his big brother Elliot. The one who didn't get anointed, you know, back in chapter 16? I wonder if he had any resentment by that when he saw his brother getting anointed. He did. Well, anyway, Eliab, the oldest brother, verse 28, and he heard that he spoke to the men, that is, David was talking to the men. Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why have you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep? You didn't see the slap in the face? Hey, boy, where's your sheep? You're supposed to be out taking care of them. You're not army territory. You're not army material. 
And then he says, adding this, I know your pride and the insolence of your heart. Wow, he was really judging there, wasn't he? Because God knew his heart too. You can just come down here to see a battle. And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? Mark that in the Bible. You underline that. Is there not a cause? Is there not a reason for somebody to stand up here and match up to this Philistine? God has causes that need to be fought. Battles where Christians ought to be stepping up and fighting for. And they're all on all different planes. Some of them are fought just inside uh, our, our neighborhoods on, on how we behave. Some are fought in schools on, on the morality issues or how we dress. And some are fought in, in job sites of, of competition and cutthroat relationships and all. And, and causes are fought everywhere. Is there not a cause? Does God not have still causes today? He's looking for people, for men and women, young and old, to stand up and say, I'm here to devote myself to you, to be dedicated to your cause. It's so easy to sit back and say nothing. But David wouldn't. He wasn't the man to step up and do it. He was a young boy. He wasn't trained. But he's not thinking in that direction. He's thinking of causes. And somebody ought to be standing up for God's causes today. Is there not a cause to be devoted to? Number two, he had a heart that fully trusted God. Even when he would put his life on the line. Back to chapter 17. He matches up to the cause. He's going out against the Philistine, verses 45. He's out there in battle and he's in front of Goliath. And this is the comments that ensue here. And David said to this Philistine, You come to me with sword. Now, stop here. Remember, Goliath's already thrown out the challenge. He's calling him a little dog. Is this all they've got in their army out here? Goliath's saying as he looks at David. It scared me. And David says, You look at me or you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts and the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with a sword or a spear, but the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my hand. David wasn't talking about his agility or how good he is with a sling or the choice of the rocks that he's going to make. He's not talking about speed or anything else. He's talking about God all the way through. His trust is in God. His deliverance is in God. His heart was fully devoted and trusting God. Psalm 20. The psalmist writes a very beautiful passage David does later on. He says, now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven. I'm reading from verse 6. With the saving strength of his right hand. And then he says in verse 7. Some trust in chariots. And some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen. But we have risen up and stand upright. I wonder if David, as he was penning those words, wasn't thinking about that giant when he fell. Or the armies of listings that he took on later on. Some trust in chariots. Proverbs 21, 31 also says, 
that the horse is prepared for the day of battle. But the deliverance, or the victory, some translations say, is of the Lord. No, David didn't have it all together all the time. You know of other things that he did wrong. The Bible's very plain about it. His relationship with Bathsheba. About what he did with Bathsheba's husband. It's also very plain about his life and how he changed things around. Because we all have our sins. And David pins in Psalm 51, verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit that's within me. Is that something we all need to think about sometimes? Because we don't win every battle. And there are spiritual battles out there a lot of times that we just give up on. But I want you to look at the mark of the disciple within David and understand his devotion, his dedication to God, and his trusting in this nature of, of what he had in God. As Christians, we are to reflect the image of our Father in every way we can as his children. To be people of the Word and be people of our own Word, as was read earlier, that our yes is yes and our no is no. That people see us as being different than the rest of the world out there. That is so messed up and so confused. That we be a reflection of what is pure in heart as God is. Instead of the immorality the rest of the world is wrapped up in. Fully devoted to God. Fully trusting in God in getting us through in every situation. Back a couple weeks ago, Melanie and I had an opportunity to, to visit Fort Sumter.